This week's lecture content is on sensing and perception from chapter 3. We'll start by having you take a look at this image. Does it make sense to you? What is happening in our brains when we view information that is at odds with what we know about reality? Let's start with the basics. Let's begin by defining a stimulus. A stimulus is any passing source of physical energy that produces a response in a sense organ. This means anything in our environment that activates our sensory system can be considered a stimulus. So that means everything in our environment that can be perceived. This might include anything that can be seen, touched, tasted, smelled, or heard. This is important when it comes to understanding sensation and perception as they play two complementary but different roles in how we interpret our world. Sensation refers to the process of sensing our environment through touch, taste, sight, sound, and smell. This information gets sent to our brains in raw form where perception then comes into play. Perception is the way we interpret these sensations and therefore make sense of everything around us. I'll explain more about perception after discussing sensation. When we talk about sensation, we are talking about the activation of our sense organs by a source of physical energy, which we have already defined as being a stimulus. So we have a stimulus that is presented to us, whether it is a sight, a sound, a taste, a touch, or a smell. And we have a sense organ that gets activated in response to that stimulus. Some examples might be the sight of your cell phone, the sound of a car honking, the touch of a breeze on your skin, the taste of ice cream, or the smell of fresh baked cookies. It's interesting to see the many varied ways our senses get activated. Take, for example, the sense of touch. The sensations can be received as a pain, a pressure, a temperature, whether hot or cold, a shaking, or a vibration, among many others. We can receive information on a very wide spectrum. What senses are being activated as you are watching this lecture now? Take a moment to think about all of the sensory information surrounding you at this very moment. Focus on the colors of the room, the feel of your clothing, the sounds coming in from the street outside, and the scents wafting through the air. In a matter of seconds, you have gained information from four major senses, vision, touch, hearing, and smell. Your sensory system serves as an entrance for information about your environment, sending it to the brain so that you then may take action. Let's look at each of the five senses. We have the visual or seeing, auditory or hearing, olfactory or smelling, gustatory or tasting, and touching. As you can see in this image, each of the different senses are located in different areas of the brain. Let's look at the visual first. Again, this is not a biology course, so I'll just cover the basics in order to further our understanding of how sensation and perception work. Here is an image of the structure of the eye. Light enters the pupil, and when light strikes either the rods or the cones of the retina, it's converted into an electrical signal that is relayed to the brain via the optic nerve. The brain then translates the electrical signals into the images we see, thereby hopefully making sense out of the stimuli entering our visual field. This next image is a cutaway of the brain, so you can see pictorially the arrangement and pathway of the incoming information. It goes in from the eyes along the optic nerve to the visual cortex. Now let's look at sound. How do we hear? Our ears have three main parts, the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The outer ear collects sound waves and channels them into the ear canal, where the sound is amplified. The sound waves then travel toward the eardrum and begins to vibrate. From the middle ear, the vibrations from the eardrum set the hammer, anvil, and stirrup into motion, which further amplify the sound. The sound waves then enter the inner ear and then into the cochlea. The cochlea is filled with a fluid that moves in response to the vibrations from the oval window. As the fluid moves, 25,000 nerve endings are set into motion. These nerve endings transform the vibrations into electrical impulses that then travel along the auditory nerve to the brain. The brain then interprets these signals, and this is how we hear. The inner ear is also responsible for balance. It lets us know where we are in space and time, where up is up and down is down. The semicircular canals that consist of three tubes that contain fluid that sloshes through them when the head moves, signaling rotational or angular movement in the brain. The otoliths sense forward, backward, or up and down motion, as well as the pull of gravity. Now for the sense of smell. 
Chemicals floating in the air reach the nostrils and dissolve in the mucus, and then specialized receptor cells, called olfactory receptor neurons, detect the odor. These neurons are capable of detecting thousands of different odors. The olfactory receptor neurons transmit the information to the olfactory bulbs, which are located at the back of the nose. The olfactory bulbs have sensory receptors that are part of the brain which send messages directly to the limbic system, which you remember are responsible for emotions and memories, which is why when we perceive a certain odor or fragrance, it may remind us of certain people, places, or events from the past. How does our sense of taste work? A substance in the mouth comes into contact with a nerve cell, which transmits messenger substances, further activating other nerve cells. These nerve cells then pass information for a particular perception of flavor onto the brain. The numerous port-like bumps on the tongue are where the substance producing the taste is transformed into a nerve signal. These bumps contain many sensory cells with a special structure called a taste bud. Adults have between 2,000 and 4,000 taste buds in total. From here, perceiving taste then gets transferred to the central nervous system by cranial nerves. All information is carried along the cranial nerves to part of the lower section of the brainstem, called the medulla oblongata. The five major tastes are sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and savory, and they can actually be sensed by all parts of the tongue. Only the sides of the tongue are more sensitive than the middle overall. This is true of all tastes, with one exception. The back of our tongue is very sensitive to bitter tastes. This is apparently to protect us so that we can spit out poisonous or spoiled foods or substances before they enter the throat and are swallowed. Remember your somatic sensory system? That is a system that is responsible for your sense of touch. It has nerve receptors that help you feel when something comes into contact with your skin, such as when you brush up against another person or your hand comes into contact with some kind of surface. These nerve receptors are sensitive to pain and temperature changes, such as hot or cold, pressure, such as when you're holding a pen or pressing buttons or touching the screen on your cell phone, or vibration, such as when you might be in a room that is vibrating from loud music. As I mentioned previously, there are a myriad of ways we experience touch. Now that we have a sense of how our senses work, let's look at an interesting phenomenon that can occur called adaptation. It is a process that is characteristic of all the senses. As receptors are continually exposed to the same stimuli, their thresholds increase and you become less aware of that stimulation, or perhaps entirely unaware of it. For example, as you sit in your chair and read this, you are probably unaware of the chair and the clothing in between pressing against your body, unless something calls your attention to it, such as a sentence. This characteristic of the senses is extremely important in helping you to focus your attention. It could be very difficult to function if you were constantly distracted by sensations such as the feel of shoes or a wristwatch, the drone of an air conditioner, sounds from outside, and so on. Some of you may have experienced this if you live near an airport, or a train station, or a busy road, but it can also happen with sounds that we may find pleasurable, like the sound of the ocean. Now let's take a look at perception. Remember that sensation is the process by which our sense organs detect and then transform incoming stimulation from our environment into neural impulses. These then get relayed to various areas of the central nervous system for further processing, which constitutes perception. Perception includes higher cognitive processes such as discriminating, recognizing, interpreting, and understanding the incoming information, and it is closely integrated with other cognitive processes such as learning and memory. In other words, perception is how you make sense of the ongoing events in your world so that you can function in it as well as acquire and accumulate knowledge about it. It is how we sort out, interpret, analyze, and integrate the information coming into our system. For example, what do you see in this picture? A duck or a rabbit? We'll explore how this might work a little later in the video. Let's look at a couple of other examples. Look at this image for a moment. Do you see it moving or vibrating? Although not completely understood, some research indicates that it has to do with fast eye movements. So our eyes see the image and our brain interprets it as moving, although it is not, due to these fast micro-movements of the eye. How about this other one? Do you see the scary face? Or do you see the figures in the archway? Can you see both at the same time? How about this next one? 
Do you see a handprint? Or do you see a lion lying down? Studying optical illusions, where perception differs from reality, is a way to discover more about the mechanisms in how our brains construct our experience of the world. We'll be working with more examples of this in class. Let's now move on to the Gestalt Principles of Perceptual Organization, which is a way of organizing the separate parts of our perceptual field into a unified and meaningful whole. Remember when I talked about the letters of the alphabet and how they made more sense when they were put into words, sentences, and paragraphs? Now take a look at this picture. We might see separate parts initially where a hunter is taking aim at an antelope. If you didn't know about the perceptual laws, then you might think that the hunter was shooting at a small elephant or that there was an antelope-shaped area in the hill rather than seeing an antelope standing in front of a hill. This is actually an example of interposition, which I will discuss in a minute. The Gestalt perceptual laws help us organize bits and pieces of information, which are the stimuli coming into our senses, into something that makes some kind of sense, a meaningful whole. Remember when I mentioned the phrase that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts? This means that the whole, say for example a painting or a car, carries a different and a greater meaning than its individual components, such as the paint, the canvas, the brush for the painting, or the tires, the paint, the metal for the car. When looking at the whole, a cognitive process takes place. The mind makes a leap from comprehending the parts to realizing the whole. We visually and psychologically attempt to make order out of chaos, to create harmony or structure from seemingly disconnected bits of information. There are a number of perceptual laws, but the main ones we'll be looking at are closure, proximity, similarity, and simplicity. I'll go into each one more fully in just a moment. Let's begin with the law of closure. You might be familiar with this picture, but did it occur to you that your mind was supplying extra information without you even being aware of it? This is an example of our tendency to supply missing information or elements to close or complete a picture that might be familiar to us, or even unfamiliar to us. Next is the law of proximity. Elements that are closer together will be perceived as an object, so that objects near each other tend to get grouped together. So you see in this picture, the first set of circles tend to get grouped together in vertical columns, or seen as a vertical column, while the other set of circles tend to get grouped together, or seen as horizontal rows. So you can see typically two distinct groups based on proximity. In the law of similarity, items that are similar tend to be grouped together. So when you look at this image, you would most likely see vertical lines of squares and vertical lines of circles as a way to organize what you are seeing and make more sense out of it. With the law of simplicity, we tend to see images in their simplest form possible. In the top image, you may see it as five overlapping circles, which you may recognize as a symbol for the Olympics, rather than as a much more complicated shape as shown in the image on the bottom. Part of perceptual organization is perceptual constancy. This includes shape, brightness, and size. I'll start with shape constancy. It is a process that allows us to recognize people and other objects from many different angles. Take, for example, this image of a door. Although the shape of the door changes from each picture, we still tend to view the door as a rectangle, even though the angles have changed. We can recognize the shape of the door and that the door is a door, regardless of the angle of the door. Shape constancy is based on the perceptual system's ability to take viewing angle into account when determining an object's true shape. With brightness constancy, the relative brightness of objects remains the same under different conditions of illumination, whether full sunlight or shade or somewhere in between. So a familiar object will appear the same color regardless of the amount of or color of light reflecting from it. The amount of light that enters the eye changes dramatically. The appearance of the brightness or lightness of the paper and ink change very little. This is a very important constancy that allows us to recognize objects in a wide range of light conditions. For size constancy, the size of objects remains relatively constant even though images on our retina change in size with variations in distance. 
This perceptual process allows us to see objects in a stable way by taking distance into account. In the three-dimensional world, this principle allows us to perceive a tall person as tall, whether they are standing next to us or off in the distance. Perceptual constancies are important because they enable us to perceive the basic unchanging nature of objects and scenes in the world around us. Without such perceptual constancy, objects would appear to change with varying illumination, viewing distances, and or different viewpoints. Now let's move on to perceptual cues. You've probably seen railroad tracks and how they appear to come together as they recede into the distance. This is an example of a perceptual cue called linear perspective, where vertical parallel lines seem to grow closer as they move further away. We know that the parallel lines do not converge, so this is yet another example of where reality and perception differ. Another perceptual cue is that of interposition. Objects closer to us may cut off part of our view of more distant objects, thus giving rise to an impression of depth. In the image here, we can see two playing cards, one corner covering the other. Our mind translates this as one card covering over the other, so one being nearer than the other, rather than one card having a shape with the corner cut out. Remember the antelope in the slide with the hunter? We typically don't see the hill as having an antelope shape in it. We also typically see the hills as one behind the other, rather than seeing them as next to each other. This then is an example of interposition. There are other factors that affect perception as well. The power of context is a good example. In this picture, the second letter looks like a B in the top line when it's with other letters, and it looks like a 13 when it's grouped with numbers. Another example is that of a gray square that looks darker next to a white background, and lighter against a darker background. The surrounding color, or the context in which the color rests, changes how we perceive that color. We'll have an opportunity to explore this some more in class. Okay, so to recap what we've been discussing with sensation and perception. We have stimuli in the form of information activating our sense organ through our skin, eyes, nose, ears, and or taste. This is the raw data that gets sent to the central nervous system for processing and interpretation as shown in this image here. This next slide shows an example of sensation and perception in action using the example of smelling a rose. You can see that the stimuli is coming in from the environment, gets translated in the brain, and then we see that we interpret it as the fragrance of a rose. Although this is a quite simplistic view, um, it does show the difference between the two processes. Okay, that's it for now.